Hello and welcome to Folklore of the Universe, the spookiest podcast in my entire haunted mansion. And the, the only folklore podcast in my haunted mansion. I'm Kyle, I'm your host. Hello, this is the Halloween special. The spooky Halloween special spooktacular. I think that's copyrighted. Don't sue me. I uh, said, so, yeah, here we are. If my voice sounds extra spooky and in in theme, um, that's because I'm sick. It's it's yeah, it's how it goes. But that's fine. You know, we'll work through that. Hopefully, this isn't hell to listen to. Um, if it is, though, that's just the ambiance. It's intentional. So I think what I'm going to do for this episode, for the special, is first I'm going to talk about some origins of Halloween, where all this biz comes from. Then I'm going to do a special Monster of the Week for this, a um, Halloween-y story, folk story, that ties into the Monster of the Week, and also ties into some ha- Halloween traditions and where those come from, and they're going to talk about those more, and that'll be the episode. So, booyah, let's do this. And if you are easily scared, don't worry, because the spookiest thing in this episode was me saying booyah, uh, mostly unironically, so that's something to... Something I'm going to live with for the rest of my life. But let's move on now. Let's talk about some Halloween. Where does this come from? Where does it go? Something, something, Cotton Eye Joe. The very, very oldest bit of Halloween in from Europe was Samhain, which is this old, old Celtic holiday uh, before Christianity came to Europe. Samhain was one of four old seasonal holidays. So Samhain was on the 1st of November, then there was um, another one, Imbolc, on the 1st of February, Bealtaine on the 1st of May, and Lugnasad on the 1st of August. Sam one was particularly different from these other ones because it was the time when the boundaries between worlds were smaller, so fairies or spirits of the dead could more easily cross back over into our world. It was also just sort of marking the end of harvest and the beginning of winter times, because this is when it started getting colder and spookier out anyway, because it's dark, there's no sun, and who knows, there's probably ghosts and demons and fairies out there. It was celebrated with a big feast and competitions and all that sort of fun stuff, and also people would light a bunch of bonfires, which were supposed to protect them from dark forces that were prowling the world. It was also a good time to take stock of food supplies to make sure you had enough stuff stored up for winter time. So originally, it was not too much different from what it is now. It was a chance to hold parties and celebrations, and there's spooky stuff going on. Uh, the only real difference is that they all lived on farms back then, so there's more of that farming harvest as- aspect to it, which we don't have now. Or at least most of us don't have now. Some of us still still do farming, live on farms. Anyway, the next evolution of this was when Christianity came to Europe. And when Christianity was being spread to the pagans, a lot of pagan holidays were sort of jury-rigged into Christian holidays to make them convert, basically. So they'd still have their holidays at the same time, still the same vibe going on. And this happened with uh, Christmas, came from Yule, which is an old pagan holiday, or Halloween came from Samhain, which is just the old one we just talked about. And with the Christian conversion... Uh, Sam 1 became All Hallows' Eve, because it was the night before All Hallows' Day on November 1st, and then All Souls' Day on November 2nd. So you can probably already see where the name Halloween comes from now. All Hallows' Eve, Hallows' Eve, Halloween. Pretty, pretty smooth transition there. Altogether, these three days were known as All Hallowtide, and this was a time for honoring the saints and also praying for recently departed souls hoping that they make it up to heaven. So you still have that sort of death, dark, spookiness vibe going on. Uh, It's just changed a bit. Now it's more about the departed, but you still... Same energy. It hasn't really changed a drastic amount. Then, of course, in the United States, it was a Christian thing, so people celebrated it, but then the, uh, the corporations and capitalists caught on to it, and it became what it is today now. It's a big consumerist, buy shit to get shit type dealio, but still got those those dark, spooky vibes and still has that sort of same origin tracing back. It's, so it has, it's changed, 
a fair bit since the original Samhain, but still the same general ideas. And to be fair, it is a pretty dark and spooky time of the year, so it is easy to see why this is so persistent. So that's a brief, brief overview of the history of Halloween. I'm going to go more into the specific traditions towards the end of the podcast, but for now, I'm going to move on to our Monster of the Week, our special Halloween Monster of the Week, and this one is the Will-O-The-Wisp. And the Will-O-The-Wisp is also sometimes known as the Jack-O-Lantern, which might sound a bit familiar because they're goddamn everywhere right now, Um, but we'll get to that in a second. What they are is a little ghost light that sort of hangs out in swamps and marshes and lures travelers off their paths to their deaths. So not quite as nice as the Halloween decoration is now. And how they work, they don't mind control you to go off the path, but if you're walking through a swamp at nighttime and see a light over there, it looks like a little lantern light, so you think, oh, there's a place I can stay, get out of the swamp for a bit, and you walk over, but there's no place, there's just will-o'-the-wisp and swamp, so you fall in and drown. Most uh, folklore story thoughts attribute them to some sort of ghost or fairy that creates them. There is one other one, which we're going to get to with our actual story, which ties into it, but there are some natural explanations as well now, now that we invented science. Nowadays, it's generally thought that these were caused by the oxidation of phosphine, diphosphane, and methane, which are all produced organically by things decaying, which happens an awful lot in swamps, and they oxidize and give off light when that happens, which would make this sort of little ghost light out in the swamps. So you know how in Men in Black, when he talks about light reflecting off Venus or whatever and hitting rogue swamp gas and lighting up? It's not completely bullshit. There's some, there's some legitimateness to that. I just really like Will-O-The-Wisps as a very good spooky Halloween-y entity, because it is a very good Halloween vibe to think of little spooky lights flittering around in the swamps at nighttime. It'd be cool ambiance. It'd be cool if they were, well, not super cool if they were real, if they lure people to their deaths, but this will be a nice little atmospheric thing to look at. Or is that just me? Maybe? Maybe some frogs too? I don't know. Anyway, they're pretty basic. Not much to talk about. They are, they're basic bitches. So we're going to move on to our story now, which does tie into the Will of the Wisps and the Jack-O-Lanterns. And you might figure out this connection from the title. This story is called Stingy Jack. Long ago, in a small village in Ireland, lived a drunkard named Stingy Jack. He wasn't held in very high regard by the townsfolk. One evening, Satan overheard stories of the devious deeds of Jack, decided that he must have this fellow's soul. Jack may have been stingy, but he was quite clever. When Satan came to collect his soul, he successfully made the case that the least Satan could do was allow him to have a final drink at his favorite pub. After which, Stingy Jack left Satan on the hook for the tab. Jack suggested he turn himself into a coin to pay the bill, and they would be off on their journey to the underworld. Satan was fooled when Jack took the coin and put it into his pocket alongside a crucifix, thereby trapping Satan in his pocket. The devil begged and pleaded, and only upon agreeing to leave Jack alone for ten years was he released. Exactly ten years later, Satan found Jack stumbling home from the pub. With a heavy sigh, Jack looked at the devil knowing full well that he intended to drag him to hell. Jack made the request of Satan to climb a nearby apple tree to get him a final snack to eat before the journey southbound. Satan, apparently still not as clever as Jack, climbs the apple tree. While Satan was climbing the tree, Jack carved a cross into the trunk, thereby trapping Satan up in the tree. The devil begged and pleaded, and only upon agreeing to never take Jack's soul to hell was he released. Many years later, when Sinju Jack took his last breath and died, St. Peter refused him entrance into heaven for all of his evil deeds. Satan refused him entrance into hell due to their contract. In one final parting gift, Satan gave Jack an ember ablaze with hellfire. Alas, Jack was stuck roaming the earth, with only a carved turnip glowing with hellfire to light his way. When Sinji Jack ceased to be, Jack of the Lantern began. On Halloween night, keep an eye out for a restless wandering soul every time you see a jack-o'-lantern, for it may just be the hellfire glow from Jack's lantern. The end. 
So this story is basically the origin story for jack-o'-lanterns that we have now, so pretty fucking cool with that. Uh, the tie-in with the Will-o'-the-Wisps is that there are alternate versions of the story where the protagonist's name is Will, and they've got sometimes slightly different plot lines where St. Peter gives them a second chance at life, but they're so bad they're cursed to wander the earth. But it's still always the same idea of having to carry around a burning ember from hell to light their way because they are doomed to wander around forever. Now you might have noticed that in this story he was forced to carry around a carved turnip with the light inside of it instead of a pumpkin, maybe wondering what's up with that. Well, Europe didn't always have pumpkins. Pumpkins are from the New World, so prior to 1492, they carved turnips instead and could do the same thing. They hollowed them out, carved little faces into them. Uh, they're really freaky, by the way. Look up uh, ha- Halloween turnips online. They are, they are pretty, they're not great. Pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns are sort of charming, cute, spooky. These are just nightmare. But still a very cool tradition, which got changed over time as they do once pumpkins came around, because they are a lot bigger, a lot more work to carve. And also probably in the New World, people carved pumpkins more because they were easier to grow, more available, and that might have spread back over to the Old World at some point. And originally, people carved these as a way of keeping Jack of the Lantern away from your house. So they're sort of a warding symbol plant that you have, because he was roaming around on Halloween night with his jack-o'-lantern, so you put your jack-o'-lantern up, and that keeps him away. What makes me curious about this story, though, is wondering where its roots are from. Because obviously, this is a very uh, Christian story with the devil and St. Peter and all that. But a lot of these folk stories come from pagan roots, So I do wonder what the pagan origins of the story were. I mean, imagine a similar thing, someone cursed to wander the world forever with the burning ember. But I don't really know what what the deal it would have been with that, with afterlives and eternity and all that business. Still, a cool story. It's cool to know where jack-o'-lantern traditions come from. And now I'm going to talk about some other Halloween traditions and where those come from too. And really, the only other big tradition is trick-or-treating which does come from some pretty old origins. It actually also comes from the Samhain times, because there's the belief that all these ghosts and spirits and fairies were back in the world, and that they could be appeased with offerings of food or drink. And what eventually happened is that people started impersonating these entities to receive these gifts on their behalf. By giving out goods and rewards to these impersonators, or essentially give them to the spirits, would bring you good fortune and protect you, then also impersonating these spirits or fairies would protect you from any malevolent action on their part. So over time this became more and more established into the tradition we have now of dressing up in costume and going door to door in exchange for small food items. And the traditional food item that were given out were soul cakes, um, not, you know, not candy, not mass-produced stuff. It was uh, these little cake cookie things which were given out, and they were filled with some spices, some sweet spices, some raisins or currants. Then often they were topped with the mark of the cross to signify that they were gifts and alms. So there were basically special little Halloween cookies they would go around and collect. And this was called souling, when you go and collect your soul cakes. Actually, there's a very nice folk song by Peter, Paul, and Mary called A Souling, which I should go listen to because that's, that's a good one. And of course, as the tradition evolved, people forgot about the whole ward off evil spirits and appease them and reward them, and it was just a thing you did. You just dressed up in costume and go to door to door and didn't really ask why you did it. It was just a fun thing to do. So a lot of the Halloween stuff we have today that we celebrate it with dates back a really long-ass time, all the way back to pagan Europe. So it's cool seeing how these traditions have evolved and stayed with us, too, for all this time. Then finally, a just brief bit on the traditional sort of Halloween foods. It's usually apple and pumpkin-related products. And I think that's less any big traditions, and more because it's just harvest time, and those are what are in great abundance. Because obviously pumpkins weren't around for a lot of European history for celebrating this, but in the New World, this is they ripen around this time, so once they became a food crop, then they got adopted into the whole fall harvest ritual, and they became a Halloween thing because they were ready for harvest at Halloween time at the fall harvest. Or stuff like corn mazes, 
that's also the same thing because this is this harvest time for all that. But that is all I really have to talk about. So thank you for listening to our spooky Halloween special. I hope you learned a bit more about Halloween. You know where all this shit comes from that we're doing now. Hopefully this put you into a Halloween mood. I know I am. I'm ready. I'm going to dress up as a uh, shaman wizard type thing. Should be pretty cool. And also, I'm going to be watching this on Halloween. And you should too. Uh, you should check out Over the Garden Wall. It's a little mini-series. It's very folklore and spooky and halloween It's really, really good. So check that out. Uh, it's, it's a mini-series, but it's basically a movie broken up into parts. So do watch it all in one go. And it is worth it. That's a, it's a folklore of the universe podcast for you from me. It's my Halloween present. That and the curse on this episode. Was that? Okay, yeah. Let's uh, wrap it up. So we're going to have another episode either next Friday or the Friday after, depending on how busy I am. But that's going to be more of a uh, turkey, Turkish themed one, because uh, I was just there. And then after that, it's just going to be episodes, regular times again, until winter. So that is all. I hope you enjoyed this again. Uh, if you did, please leave a review or a rating or tell your friends, family about it. If you've got any feedback, shoot me an email. My email's in the uh, description down below. And that is all. So I've been Kyle. This has been Folklore of the Universe. And have a happy Halloween. Bye.